this is the way production is going to go in the future. Connected devices reporting their status, which then can be reported back to the R&D division of the manufacturer so that better and better devices are made. Harley-Davidson, mass customization. This is the web page that you go to on the Harley-Davidson website if you want to make a custom Harley bike. You choose which bike you want to, to, to buy and then you choose all the customizations you can have. It used to take Harley 21 days to make a custom bike. Now they can do it in six hours. And if you order a custom bike and you customize it yourself from Harley, you get an invitation to come to their factory. And you're introduced to the block of metal that's going to be your custom Harley. And you're walked down the production line as it's being made. And then at the end of the six hours, you're handed the keys to your Harley and you drive it off the lot. That kind of customer experience is only possible with digital manufacturing where you can have mass customization. And 3D printing, this is a trend that's happening very much now as well. UPS, the big logistics company, are moving to 3D printing. Why would a logistics company move there? Well, UPS are holding inventory of critical parts for their customers. In the US alone, they have 1.8 trillion US dollars of critical parts in stock. And they don't want to be holding warehouses full of stock. So they virtualize the stock, hold them in virtual warehouses, and 3D print them when they're required, and then ship them to site. There's a whole certification process they go through with the customers to make sure the customers are happy with the quality of the 3D part. One of the things that you need to think about, what is this going to do, is product as a service reduces massively for companies their entry cost, particularly for asset-intensive industries like the energy industry. If there are no, if you are not buying products anymore, if you're not buying assets, if you're just getting them on a usage basis, your startup costs fall rapidly. So organizations that have high startup costs that are asset heavy now can face competition from places they would never have thought of before because the startup costs are falling to zero. We'll move on because I have a lot of slides to get through. Speaking of the energy industry, we're seeing three huge disruptions happening in the energy industry. We're seeing connected energy, we're seeing the move to renewables, and we're seeing the move to storage. Now, why are we seeing the move to renewables? Well, we're seeing cratering costs of renewables. This is a chart called the Swanson Effect. The Swanson Effect is like Moore's Law for solar. The Swanson Effect says, that for every doubling of installed capacity of solar, you get a 20% reduction in price, which of course leads to a beautiful virtuous circle. Price falls, becomes more attractive, more people buy it, price falls, more people buy it, etc., etc. And you can see that's a graph from 77 to 2013. And this is a continuation of that trend from 2013 to 2016. The dark red bars are subsidized pricing for solar. The light red bars are pink bars are the actual unsubsidized price. And you can see the price has gone. It's hard to see there, but I'll tell you. The price has gone from, on the left-hand side in 2013, 8 cents per kilowatt hour, down to this auction in Chile in 2016, where it's under 3 cents per kilowatt hour. To put that in context, Dubai generates most of electricity from burning gas at a cost of 9 cents per kilowatt hour. Solar is now coming in Chile at... Uh, three cents per kilowatt hour, just under three cents per kilowatt hour. And that trend didn't stop in 2016. It keeps going and keeps going and keeps going, and it will keep going because the costs, the reduction costs are technological. This is a chart of bids for a solar plant in, in, Saudi, in Saudi last year, late last year. And you can see the, the bids from the eight different companies. Seven of those bids came in at under three cents per kilowatt hour. One came in at under two cents per kilowatt hour. So that trend is continuing and will continue and continue. And hence, you see, this is the uh, estimated amount of solar that, that's going to be deployed from here out to 2022. Uh, obviously, it's going up and going up and will continue to go up. And it will continue to go up driven by things like this. This is the solar roof that Tesla are rolling out. Those tiles are not typical slate tiles. Those are solar tiles on the roof. And Elon Musk has said that those solar roofs will sell for the same price 
as a slate roof of the same size. So those roofs will produce solar power. And we'll come back to that later. But it's not just solar. Wind costs are cratering as well, and wind is being deployed far and far more often because it's far more competitive now than it was in the past. And I mentioned storage. Storage costs are falling as well. Storage costs in 2010 were $1,000 per kilowatt hour. By 2017, that had fallen to 200, 20% of the price it was in 2010. And that trend is continuing as well. And it's not just the cost of solar. This is a press release out of, out of、uh, Samsung late last year in November when they talked about a new breakthrough that they had had on storage, which meant that they were able to get a 45% increase in energy density and also a five times greater charging speed. So, faster charging batteries, more energy dense batteries, and cheaper batteries because the price is going to keep coming down. So, we're getting energy dense batteries. And these, that's not a unique. Uh, news release. That's just one I happen to pick. Those kind of news releases are coming out week after week after week. And consequently, this is the prediction for deployment of solar globally from here until 2030. Over on the left hand side, you can see where 2018 is. That's the prediction for 2018. And look how it goes right out to 2030. Storage is going to be huge. Huge deal, and it's going to change enormously how things happen in energy. I mentioned Tesla's solar roof. And the picture there, that's not a Tesla solar roof, that's normal solar panels. But Tesla have come up with a deal in South Australia where they're going to deploy their solar roofs along with their, with their power wall batteries. That white thing on the right hand side of the image there is a, is a Tesla home storage battery. It's 14 kilowatt hours of storage. They're deploying those on 50,000 homes in South Australia. The solar roof and the battery combined. They're going to connect them all up, all 50,000 homes, with those batteries to create a virtual power plant. It's like cloud computing for energy. It's a virtualized power plant of 50,000 generators into one unit of 650 megawatts of production. That's the same kind of output you'd get from a gas fired power plant or a, a coal plant. They're doing that with home batteries, which are, as I said, 14 kilowatt hours. Wait until they do it with cars, because those cars have an average 80 kilowatt hour battery. They expect to be selling in the order of 500,000, is what Elon Musk says, per year. But even if they only get to 250,000 cars per year, and those batteries are 80 kilowatts or 80 kilowatt hours, if they get 250,000 cars by 80 kilowatt hours, that's 20. Gigawatt hours of storage. Remember, I said the virtual power plant with the house or houses was 650 megawatt hours. This would be 20 gigawatt hours per year. That's enormous. So, if you think Tesla is a car company, not at all. Tesla is an energy company, and they're disrupting the market hugely. One thing we're going to see as well, because of the cratering costs of generation in energy, we're going to see the energy companies move to something like an all you can eat model, similar to broadband, where you pay a set amount per annum, and for that set amount, you have all the energy you want, and then they layer services on top of that, and that's where they make their differentiation. What kind of services? Well, this is a picture of my dad on his 80th birthday. He lives in Ireland alone. My mum died in 2007. He's one of a generation of seniors who are elderly, living alone with younger relatives who are interested in their well being. It's not an unusual use case. Would I pay his energy company 5, 10, 15 euros a month to get a notification? If his lights didn't go off at 11 o'clock at night or didn't come on at 8 o'clock in the morning, in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. And as I say, that's a growing demographic, and that's just one use case. We're talking about exceptional energy use cases. Maybe you have a second home and the lights go on and you're not there. You want to be notified. Or the power goes off and you have a fridge full of food there. 
you want to be notified. You can imagine lots of different use cases for energy services that utilities could be offering. If they don't, somebody else will. Transportation. Enormous changes happening there. Things like predictive maintenance, the electrification of the fleets, the autonomy. I'll go through that quickly as well. One of our customers, uh, Continental, are rolling out predictive maintenance for cars. And they're enabling service centers to, do, to, to allow your cars to become assets which predict when they're going to fail. So your car, instead of breaking down and you drifting over to the side of the road or a warning light coming on and you having to wait and get it diagnosed, instead of that, the car will notify your appointed service center, which will know when your car is going to break down, why it's going to break down, and it'll schedule replacement parts and the whole thing, so it'll become a seamless operation and your downtime on your car will be minimal. That's going to become a thing, big time. If we move on to electrification, the electrification of cars has got a huge kick in the ass from China. Why? Because China passed a law which said for all the OEMs, all the car manufacturers who want to sell into China, and China is the world's largest car market, if you want to sell cars in China and you're a manufacturer, you have to, next year, 2019, you have to have 10% of your fleet be electric vehicles. As a consequence of that pronouncement, we got major announcements from all the car manufacturers. You can see there Volkswagen, Ford, Toyota, GM, all are now saying that they're getting into electric vehicles. Even Porsche have announced that they're doubling their investment to 6 billion euro. All the manufacturers are going electric. And it's not just cars. China reported this year that it was disappointed that it only sold 90,000 electric buses, fully electric buses, last year. It's not just buses. Tesla and Daimler have announced electric trucks. Tesla said this morning that it, it or actually was Elon Musk said yesterday on an earnings call that they expect to sell 100,000 of these trucks a year every year, and they've already gotten hundreds of orders from organizations like DHL, UPS, Anheuser-Busch, Pepsi, Walmart, etc. Planes are going electric as well. This is Airbus. Airbus have gotten into uh, an agreement with Rolls-Royce and Siemens to start off with hybrid electric planes. And then we have EasyJet, who have announced that they're getting together with Wright Electric out of America to create electric jets for short-haul flights, flights of two hours, where they can go 530 kilometers and carrying 120 people. They expect these to be in the air by 2026. Ships are going electric as well. And we see uh, Rolls-Royce talking about not just having electric ships, but they being drone ships. And speaking of drone and autonomy, I mentioned autonomous was coming as well. So Tesla's autonomous cars are the start of the move to autonomy in cars, to general autonomy in cars. And they, one of the Tesla cars was in a crash and there was a huge investigation into it, which reported that Tesla cars in autonomous mode crash 40% less than when Tesla cars are being driven manually. Autonomous cars are far, far safer than manually driven cars. And as a consequence of that, of course, the insurance industry has sat up and taken notice. And Direct, uh, Direct Line, who are one of the largest, no, they are the largest insurer in the UK, are now offering discounts to drivers with autonomous vehicles. So soon it'll be a case of, oh, you want to drive the car yourself? Okay, that's this whole other far more expensive policy. So autonomy is coming. GM announced just last week that in 2019, next year, it's launching a fleet of robot taxis based on their, on their Chevy Volt, Chevy Bolt, based on their Chevy Bolt chassis. But these cars won't have a steering wheel and they won't have pedals. They'll be autonomous taxis and they're launching fleets of them in US cities next year. GMs say that they make $30,000 on each car they sell after they sell it. 
on after-sales service. But they reckon with, car, with fleets like this, that 30,000 will pale into insignificance. They'll be making far more on fleets of autonomous robot taxis because they're just keeping used and used 24 hours a day. And the, there's this great article on, on this website called CB Insights, which talks about 24 different industries that are going to be impacted by autonomous vehicles. And you can think of lots of them. Parking industry is going to go away. Real estate, media, entertainment. Who's going to be the first autonomous fleet who signs a deal with Netflix? So all these industries are going to be impacted by this. Parking is a huge one, obviously. Traffic enforcement. Who's going to make website? Or sorry, who's going to make traffic lights? Why would you? But it's not just cars. We're going to start to move to flying vehicles, flying autonomous vehicles. Uber are launching taxis, flying autonomous taxis in 2020 in three cities, LA, Dallas, and Dubai. And they're getting together with NASA to develop the standards around how these vehicles communicate with each other and communicate with air traffic control. It's not just Uber. Uh, there are other organizations like this is Ch the Chinese company, Ehang, who've developed a flying drone uh, for taking people. This is Lilium out of Germany who are doing the same thing. This is Airbus. And this is Airbus's concept for what they call urban air mobility. So they're getting it in, into it as well. And one thing you have to remember, if you're creating connected devices, is that you're not creating connected cars, you're creating computers which can move. And to make sure you're not hacked, like this car was in this story in Wired Magazine in 2013, you've got to make sure that you build security in from the get-go. Healthcare is being massively disrupted as well by a move to data-based medicine. This is a, an image from an application monitoring uh, blood pressure, my sister's blood pressure. She was diagnosed with very high blood pressure. It was 150 over 89. She was told to wear a cuff, a connected cuff, to monitor her blood pressure. It turned out her blood pressure was 108 over 75. She was suffering from what the doctors call white coat syndrome. Every time she went into the doctor's office, her blood pressure spiked. And she's far from being unique in that. But this is what doctors base their diagnosis on, on the data that they get when you visit their office, which is a snapshot and is very often misleading because it's out of context. So it was reported just this week that a large-scale study of the Apple Watch and data from it and other wearables, not just the Apple Watch, they can predict things like the onset of stroke, they can predict the onset of diabetes, and many other things like that, because they're getting the data in real time, and they can examine it in context and make far better diagnoses. So you can imagine a situation where you have this data going to a trusted health cloud, and when some of your signals go out of tolerance, a notification goes to your appointed service center, and you get pulled in for predictive maintenance. And if there are some parts that need changing, we've got 3D printing for that too. This is a study of uh, mice ovaries being 3D printed, transplanted into mice, and those mice then giving birth to live young. And it's not just mice. This is a study out of Madrid last year, where they 3D printed human skin for transplant onto people, in burn victims and the like. And this is just the start of it. If you follow that link, there's an interview with the lead scientist where he says skin is just the start. They want to 3D print all human organs. Blockchain, I'll go through this quickly, running out of time. So, uh, Blockchain, the International Monetary Fund, uh, have announced that it's going to massively disrupt central banks. Central banks are saying, 26% of them are saying, that in the next few years they're going to roll out blockchain initiatives. Uh, it's not just the uh, financial industry. Hospital expenses, they say, can be cut by 20% by blockchain. MIT are rolling out diplomas on blockchain. Uh, the Ukraine are using it for procurement. 
uh, procurement services. Uh, Republic of Georgia are using it for land titles. Uh, the Estonia is creating an, a, 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 the, what they call the Est coin. It's a currency or a coin that they're going to use for ICOs because they want to become the place where people do ICOs. Going beyond that, the World Wildlife Fund are using it for monitoring uh, catches of tuna to make sure that there's no slavery and the, and the, the catches are, are legal. And it's being used uh, for disaster relief. It's being used for incentivizing solar power production. Artificial intelligence. This is the spinning jenny, the, the machine that kicked off the Industrial Revolution. And there was a lot of people afraid that this thing was going to come and steal their jobs. Sound familiar? This is a Deloitte study of how, over 140 years, from 1871 to 2011, the, the jobs of uh, washers and launderers collapsed. But at the same, and you can see as well on this chart, caring professions uh, on the dark blue have gone in 1871 from 1% to 12%, and muscle jobs have gone down from 23 to 8%. So the, the market shifts, but we haven't had mass unemployment. In fact, we've had an uptick in jobs in professional services like accountants, bar staff, hairdressers. So people have more money to spend on looking after themselves. You can think of gyms, you can think of uh, hotels, leisure industry, all that kind of thing. Massive uptick. My own role, IoT evangelist, was a job that didn't exist five years ago. And I fully expected not to exist in five years' time. But I don't think I'm going to be out of a job. In 1900, 63% of employees worked either in agriculture or factories. 63% in 1900. By 2015, that was 11%. So, and there's still not massive unemployment, but if I had been here in 1900 saying over 50% of you are going to be out of a job, there would have been hysteria. So, technology is not going to steal your jobs, it's just going to change them. Lastly, I was talking to uh, a guy in Schneider Electric who told me it cost them $2 to put a system on a chip. $2, and that was in 2014. So by now, that cost has gone down to below a dollar. So everything is going to be connected. So terms like Internet of Things, digital transformation in five to 10 years' time are going to become redundant. The same way that interactive website a thing that was a thing that people used to say in the 1990s is redundant. Nobody says that anymore. So, Internet of Things, digital transformation, those terms are going to go away. Nikola Tesla has this great quote where he says, when wireless is perfectly applied, the whole Earth will be converted into a huge brain, which in fact it is, all things being particles of a real and rhythmic whole. He said that in 1926. And he's absolutely right. So, in conclusion, digital is taking off. It's going to change everything. Companies and countries are embracing it. Now is the time for you to get on board. Gracias.